And now we can finally go to the first session, which is called Theoretical Perspective, Audiation and the Compositional Process. And we start with a keynote lecture by Roger Redgate. Welcome. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here in, in Vilnius once more. I'd like to thank uh, Romantis and Aiste and all the team for inviting me back and to give a, a keynote speech. Um, these are really wonderful conferences with very interesting papers, um, and it's, it's marvelous that this kind of event takes place. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do the same sort of format I did last year, if any of you remember. I'm I'll introduce myself a little bit first, um, and then I'm going to read a shortish paper that I've written, which is to give my work a bit of perspective um, in a theoretical sense. And then I'm going to look at some scores of, of my pieces. So I'm essentially going to be talking about my own work. I'm a composer. Um, and what audiation might mean um, to, to me. Um, I'm also going to, I haven't decided quite how much of other scores I will use because I'm sure that they're very well known to people here. There, there are some um, famous scores I was thinking of um, illustrating um, just in terms of musical images. Um, but they're very well known, so I, I don't want to waste too much time showing scores that you're probably very familiar with. Anyway, so as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm a composer. Um, notation is very important to me, and when we think about audiation, the, um, the process of what happens in the mind of a composer and how it gets down on the page is the, uh, the, the fundamental issue. And obviously the aspect that intervenes there is, is notation, the functionality of notation, how we transcribe or what exactly it is that exists in the mind of a composer. Every composer is different um, today. There are lots of different languages. Um, and I'm not sure we all share the same kind of process. And the nature of a score, of course, has a very different relationship um, to um, a, a performance, for example. I'm also an improviser. I spend a lot of time improvising, and something which interests me a lot is crossing the boundary between notation and improvisation. I think there's, there's, there's an interesting threshold there um, in terms of what can and can't be notated and how notation might function um, in relation to instrumental techniques. And I've written some pieces which explore this area, and one in particular I'm going to um, talk about in a moment. Anyway, so I'm, I'm going to start now by, by reading. I always hate reading things, but I, I'm going to read... Um, a paper that I've written just for, for clarity. Um, so, as I said, I, my aim here is to try and contextualise my view in, in re relation to how notation functions um, and how a piece comes about in relation to my own work. I'm interested to know if other people have similar experiences. <coughs> I also have a cough, so excuse me if I keep spluttering th throughout. <coughs> so, I, I called the paper... Um, <coughs> Do you hear what I hear? Um, that's an interesting question because um, what, what I hear in my head is, is not necessarily what you're going to hear when a piece is performed. A, a lot of music might be like that, but I, I think very little is. Um, so I'll just read the paper and, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. So, <clears throat> do you hear what I hear? I could equally well ask the question, do I hear what I hear when a work is finally realised? In this paper, I want to examine the nature of the creative discourse seen as a complex process between what might be said to exist in the mind of a composer, what we assume is a kind of audiative process, and the final realisation in performance. This usually requires some kind of in intervention in the form of notation, um, leaving aside aspects of improvisation and forms of music um, that, that are not notated, such as aspects of sonic art and installations, etc., However, in such inst instances, recorded material would also be some kind of score. Um, also for an improviser, an instrument is some kind of score, so there's still that kind of relationship to a, of a, a transcription anyway. Notating in itself, of course, is an auditive process. Um, Edwin Gordon, who is probably going to be mentioned a few times throughout this conference, um, called <clears throat> referred to notational audiation. And as the work unfolds, further audiative potential develops either through notation, uh, compositional processes, or both. 
Uh, once when asked whether he could hear music when he writes, um, Stravinsky said it's not always a question of hearing it, but knowing what it sounds like. And alternatively, John Cage commented, I don't hear music when I write it. Um, I, write, sorry, I, I write in order to hear something I haven't yet heard. My writing, writing is almost characterised by something unfamiliar in the notation. So my papers jumped here. So yeah, my writing is almost characterised by something unusual in the notation. The notation is about something that is not familiar. However, in both cases, there are arguably still kind of audiative impulse relating to more or less specific material. In the case of Stravinsky and Cage, that is. So what is the nature of this initial apprehension of sound or musical image in the mind of a composer? And further, to what degree might it be conditioned by its own possibility in notation as something already given? Each stage of this discourse involves some degree of audiation, from the initial concept, whatever form, um, in the mind of the composer, to its setting down in notation and subsequent rereading by a performer, or as an object of analysis for students and scholars. Even the more prescriptive scores, um, such as work, works by Helmut Lachenmann, um, draw off from a detailed analysis of sonic criteria um, and auditive scanning. Um, I'm just going to show you. Uh, Hel Lachemann's Pression, this is probably known to you. I'm going to play you a video of this because it's interesting to watch the performance. So I'm thinking now about what might e have existed in Lachemann's head. interested in here, of course, is what we hear when we look at a score like this, <coughs> or what Lachenmann's process was in terms of notating the piece. Uh, similarly, a score like this one, which is Brian Fernyhill's Time and Motion Study Number 2. So if we think about looking at a score and hearing it in our head, both these are examples which are actually quite difficult in that sense. Um, the layers of complexity in this piece, um, the complex playing techniques, all make it rather difficult to know what it's going to sound like. Even from a performance point of view, there's a considerable depth of material that you have to work through in order to learn the piece. Um, and then try and decide whether you're actually doing it right or not. I don't know if we have anybody in the room who's played this kind of music. I certainly have. Um, and you're not always sure you're doing it right. Um, you can imagine with a piece like The Lachen Man, um, I've played his Toccatina for solo violin, which is a, a similar form of notation. And there are a lot of questions that arise about what this should sound like, what kind of sounds should come out of the instrument, um, whether you're actually performing it in the right kind of way. Anyway, back to the paper. So the origins of the term audiation are probably well known to everyone here, um, through the work of Edwin Gordon, who coined it in 1975, as an alternative concept uh, to um, oral perception or oral imagery, um, the latter being considered as having strong associations with notation and image. However, this, as this paper focuses specifically on composition, a notational context is presupposed, which Gordon refers to as symbolic association, under the category of discrimination learning, the ability to determine whether 
two elements are the same or not the same. I'll come back to this notion of representative similarity a little bit later on. However, Gordon's research, of course, is significantly biased towards familiar tonal rhythmic patterns um, as an educational uh, tool, which already presupposes quite specific aspects in terms of material and notational potential. We could even say a cliché. The auditive relationship to notation is revealed at a later stage almost as a kind of se um, surprise uh, secret that you might be able to notate something. Gordon here is dealing with structures very clearly defined by notation. The not notion of whether something is the same or not the same would further seem to suggest a process of transcription, whether there is a direct relationship between what is heard and what is notated, um, presumably always allowing for degrees of latitude in performance. You know, we're all aware of... Um, some stylistic changes, for example, that playing Debussy's music is difficult, uh, different to playing Brahms, for example. Um, so the, 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 there's a suggestion that there's a transcriptive process involved. Um, the composer Buzzoni also observed that notation relates to some kind of transcriptive process. Every notation is in itself the transcription of an abstract idea going on to say that the instant the pen seizes it, the idea loses its original form. However, perhaps what might be perceived as being not the same has more potential as material, as a strategic distancing from an initial auditive impulse, which might nevertheless maintain an audi auditive stimulus. This is when the process of composition begins. Any attempt to trace an idea back to a fictive auditive origin is necessarily rather speculative and pointless. However, any form of setting down inevitably references some kind of auditive image. I continue to use the term image, as I would argue that from a composer's perspective, um, there is in fact a strong, almost visual imagery um, associated with audiation. In my own work, for example, I've often spoken of capturing the reality of a musical image, which lies beyond the concept of simple or direct representation in the transcriptive sense, uh, but nevertheless has a strong auditive element. What happens when the musical image lies beyond its own immediate possibility in notation? Uh, the Lachan Man, for example. We might agree that notation often falls short of representation. As the composer Brian Fernieho has commented, no notation of whatever iconically representational status can presume to record information en encompassing all aspects of the sonic phenomenon for which it stands. Gordon further proposed that audiation is to music what thought is to language or visualising to imagery although he was careful to stress that music is not a language, um, as it has no words or grammar, um, but it does have syntax. Such syntax today, however, is rather relative in the sense that no, there is no common language as such, and each composer arguably defines their own language within certain compositional tendencies, of course. The role of audiation, therefore, might vary quite considerably from one composer to the next, depending on how the initial material is conceived. We might consider a work like Messiaen's um, Mode de Valeur, for example, which has a, a, almost a composition kit, in a sense. All the materials are very clearly defined um, from the beginning, but before the composition process actually starts. I, I assume this work is probably well known to everyone, but e everything is set, the du durations, the dynamics, the pitches, the registers, etc. Um, so the audi audiation process in this sense is quite specific to the relationship with the material. I often ask my composition class, um, what would be the starting point for composition? If I said to all of you, no, let's try it, um, we're now going to write a string quartet, think about it. So what goes on in your mind now? Are you trying to hear something? Is there something that you're thinking, oh, a string quartet, are you thinking about the sound of a string quartet? Are you thinking about a structural approach? What are we all hearing? What is that process when we sit down to write a piece of music? You have a blank sheet of paper in front of you. It might have five lines on it, it might not. Um, but there's that, that moment where we think we're now going to compose and something goes on here. But of course the relationship between language and thought is very complex, which is further compounded when we start to consider the relationship between thought, language, speech and writing. The philosopher Jacques Derrida, for example, posited that writing is not simply a representation of speech, but the process of recording or encoding thoughts in writing strongly affects the nature of knowledge. His adopted term grammatology, he wrote his famous book of grammatology, um, relates to a critique of the conceptual structure imposed on thought by Western metaphysics, 
which determines the exteriority of speech to writing and similarly of speech to thought. Through grammatology, Derrida seeks to articulate a writing which no longer functions as a representation of speech, but which subverts the hierarchy of thought, speech, and writing. Grammatology, therefore, cuts across all divisions of knowledge, being concerned with all manner of inscription, uh, with the question of how, how any form of knowledge relates to writing. Ultimately, writing here influences thought. For me, this has always been a strong resonance in the relation to the functionality of notation in music, which draws on the interplay between audiation, structure, notation, and performance, which is what um, is the actual origin of a musical idea. Adorno, in his 1961 article, Vary in Music Informelle, I don't know if everyone is familiar with this work, but it's, um, he discusses the, um, a possible approach to the compositional process, commented on the qualitative change brought about by structural systematization, uh, systematization um, which further abandons the experience which gave rise to it. This seems equally appropriate to the notation of the musical idea, as Buzoni suggested. Adorno further focuses attention on music's functionality, emphasising the contradiction between its congealed written state and the fluid state it signifies, and, and discusses how recent developments in music discard what he calls fictive dynamism, um, to make itself as static in its acoustic form as it always was in its written form. He further raises important issues relating to the nature of what could be said to exist in the mind of a composer, suggesting that highly complex or 12-note scores presumably always elude a fully um, adequate formulation in the imagination. According to Gordon, a musician who can audiate is able to bring musical meaning to notation, and a musician who cannot audiate um, can only take theoretical meaning from notation. The functionality of such a process, however, <clears throat> is evidently less direct than is often presumed to be the case. Adorno continues, the element of the unforeseen must not be allowed to escape. From this point of view, music informelle would be the idea, um, Vorstellung in German, of something not fully imagined. It would be the integration of the composer's subjective ear of what simply cannot be imagined at the level of each individual note. Perhaps it's notation itself, therefore, which forms an important front here between a, a meaningless objectification and the possibility of a composition which fulfills the imagination by transcending it. As Adorno suggests, the recognition of such a frontier implies the possibility of crossing it through the need to think beyond its own limitations. <clears throat> Interestingly, the musicologist Peter Kivy suggested that musical notation is not separable from the music it notates. Um, there is not the music on the one hand and notation on the other, rather the two interpenetrate one another in such a manner as to make them both parts of the work of, the work of art, rather than notation in service, so to speak, of the artwork. A further issue, um, an interesting point that um, Kivi raises in relation to the work of, of Leo Treitler, the musicologist, is that in certain kinds of early music, writing down was a kind of performance, concluding that all musical notation is a kind of performance and therefore must be part of the work. It's interesting that Gordon is also reputed to have likened audiation to music um, as visualising is to imagery. I mentioned earlier that music has a strong sense of an auditive image, and in this respect I was struck by the potential similarities between painting and composition, um, in the sense that <clears throat> there is always um, a given, a figurative image. The philosopher Gilles Deleuze has discussed at length in his book The Logic of Sensation, in relation to the work of um, Cezanne and Francis Bacon, um, both artists were concerned with the problematic nature of figurative givens um, perceived as clichés, something always already there, an inherited image. And further redundant after the advent of photography, of course, which is um, the ultimate representation of an image. I've already mentioned the possible connection here with musical givens in the form of notational clichés, a material that is necessarily mediated and preformed by the general historical sedimentation of our notational system. To notate is already to surrender one's spontaneous reactions to the principles of construction. Material which submits um, its... <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Material submits to its condition in notation, responds to its own laws and constitutes itself in an objectively compelling way in the musical substance itself, and possibly of an uh, unrevised, unrestricted freedom will subsequently always be mediated by notation. To be clear, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm thinking about notation in scores which bear some kind of representational relationship to a musical image, 
always assuming that graphic and indeterminate scores intentionally avoid such a direct relationship to the material. Such works are realised in performance as opposed to being transmitted through performance, in which case examination of the scores will provide little in the way of auditive information. I'm thinking now of some graphic scores such as um, <coughs> L. Brown's December 1952, which is uh, probably very well known to everyone here. Let's just listen to a bit of the performance. As listeners, we don't often consider what the score looks like um, if we listen to this as a piece of music. We can imagine in our minds what that might look like. Um, if you're familiar with pieces that use this kind of playing techniques, um, we can probably imagine how the score would look. Um, you probably all know that this is how the score looks. Maybe not quite what you would have expected when on listening to the piece. <clears throat> The curious thing about that performance that you heard, though, and this is something I've always found rather interesting about this, um, it was given by David Tudor. It's his famous recording of the work. Um, he worked with Earl Brown, um, of course, very closely, and I think he might have even done one of the first performances of this piece. Um, but he made a realisation of it. Um, in other words, he renotated it. He wrote out a, part, a version of the piece which he always plays himself. So I asked myself, is it the same piece? Um, the interpretation is very different when you're playing something that's notated on conventional um, manuscript paper as opposed to a piece that looks like this, for example. Just as a matter of interest, I'll play you a different version of it. I wasn't going to do this, but um, I think just to illustrate the point. Just bear with me. I've got so much music in here. So that is the same piece, of course. So that is a different version of exactly the same piece. So this score, of course, is, is very variable. Um, another work we might consider in this context um, is Christian Wolf's Edges. Let's hear a little bit of this one. Imagine it in your minds. This is a performance just by two musicians. It can be played by um, any number of people. And that score looks like this. These are the instructions. And of course, another famous work, while we're looking at graphic notation, is Cornelius Cowdery's Treatise, which is known to you as well. It's a 
very famous score that looks like this. I teach an improvisation course at Goldsmiths, um, the University of London, um, and I often say to my students, and we can try this as an experiment, no, you can do it yourselves, can you hear this? Let's just play it to ourselves. I'll turn the page for you. I'm not going to go through all the pages, don't worry. There are 173 of them. I'm interested whether the, this has a, a musical impact on you. Um, we think about music in terms of musical notation, but if we look at something like this, this is the probably most famous page from Cardew's treatise. Well, what does it sound like? How do we play this? There are no instructions in the score whatsoever about how it would be played. I personally, when I look at this, have an immediate response to it in terms of how it might sound. Um, I've done performances of the piece. I'm just going to play you a little extract from one. Um, what's interesting about this... Um, it's, it's a little video of a, of a performance um, I did with a colleague of mine, um, also, also with a painter who's an improvising painter who has synesthesia. Um, so he has a, a very visceral and immediate response to music in terms of colour and visual images. Um, and so he's painting a wall at the same time that we're playing, and I'm playing the violin in this performance, um, and a colleague of mine is working with a computer, and there's a, a dancer, Susanna Recchia, um, who's also involved. I'll just jump into the middle of it somewhere so you can... Just hear a bit. So this is Cardew's treatise, that, not actually the pages that you saw, but um, the similar graphic. Um, sorry. I always question whether scores like this involve improvisation or not. People often re refer to these kind of graphic scores from this kind of period as involving improvisation, that the musicians are invited to improvise. They certainly have some kind of performative freedom, but I personally don't feel that it's improvising. Um, there's a score. The, the treatise is a score, and for me it's as rich as a score of as Brian Fernihill, for example, that we looked at earlier. It just contains very different information, and so my responses to it are musician and the potential of what I hear are, are very different. So now I'm just going to look at some of my own notated pieces. Um, first I'm going to talk about a, a very short piano piece. I can play the entire piece for you, um, which is called Boys. <coughs> um, you'll realise already that that's... Uh, dedicated to the um, German artist. For what I was saying in the paper, if it came across, I, I'm interested in the fact that notation has elements that don't necessarily represent what goes on in the mind of the composer. It has a potential and a musical structure of itself, which is nevertheless has a kind of auditive stimulus. Um, the compositional process itself, when I, when I work, working with, comp with, with, uh, with the processes of composition, which are not always to do with notes, for example, still convey something. And so, again, the idea of what it is that exists in the mind of the composer when I sit down to write, um, are we transcribing something? So I'm going to play this piece for you now, and you can imagine yourselves if you had this in your head. I'm not saying I had it in my head, actually, um, whether this is how you would start to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll play the whole piece because it's quite short. <laughs> So again, how do we go about writing a piece like that? What is it that exists in the composer's mind? I can't actually tell you what was in my mind when I wrote this piece. Um, I know there was a kind of visual image. Um, I'm not sure to what degree I heard it, I saw it. Um, and I was interested in the notational possibilities. And as soon as I started to compose, I started to hear the potential in what I was doing. Um, this is how the score looks. So as you can see, it involves a lot of grace notes, which are kind of outside of time. Um, I'm interested in what I was discussing earlier about, the, um, for example, like the relationship with painting, that we have figurative givens that we might want to try and avoid. Francis Bacon, for example, was very concerned with figurative painting, but at the same time, not representation, but re representing many different levels of sensation. Um, so notationally, I was ex experimenting, in a sense. The piece is about the notation. You can see there are bars, such as the one here, for example, where there's no actual rhythm as such, but an implied rhythm by the grace notes. Um, there are complexities of performance where um, there are things that can't be articulated very clearly, with this bar here, for example. So there are arpeggiated chords, um, which have to be done in, in one hand, which um, distort the rhythm, rhythmic potential of it. And it's this aspect of the piece, the notational potential as material, that I was interested in exploring. Which was possibly the starting point for the piece as a, as a visual impact in my mind, rather than an oral image. Um, but once I started to put dots on the page, the potential of the notation starts to unfold. This is page two. So there's a relationship here between um, the performance issues. The performer has to make a lot of decisions um, how these notes fit together, for example, um, how fast they are. Um, there's the, the difficulty of leaping around the keyboard, which also makes the actual performance of the piece quite um, complex. So there's a lot of performative decisions about how to interpret this score. Um, but in a sense, there's no freedom. It's all very, very precisely notated. Another work I wanted to look at an extract from is a, a piece called Felassandre, which is for um, solo cello. You can see the information, the details of it here. This is the score. I'm interested here uh, in, in this passage, starting from here. Which was a very specific image in my mind. Um, you can see the notation is quite complex. What, what is happening here is that the, the cellist hand is, is kind of pinned to the fingerboard. So the thumb is doing a glissando um, and the other fingers are doing finger percussion. 
it, it's, it's notated, repressed, and introverted. It was a bit of a joke for my sister-in-law who, who did the first performance of the piece. Um, but again, the, the stimulus for this was the physical nature of what the player was doing. That the, that the hand was in, was in this very difficult um, situation in terms of the, what, what was required of the performer. Um, and of course the, com the complexity of the, the rhythmic interaction. Again, I'm not quite sure what I heard in the auditive sense. There was an image. Um, I'm going to play you two different versions of this. It starts from the, the top of the page here and goes on to a second page. Um, so this first clip is, is Julia Ryder, for whom the piece was written. So that's here now. I'll cut that short there. This is um, another performance of the same passage. Um, this is Franklin Cox, who's recorded it on CD. <laughs> sound repressed and introverted, do they? Do the pieces sound the same? Does it sound like the same piece, do you think? No? One of them is slightly faster than the other, of course. Um, that, that happens in Beethoven. It doesn't make any, any difference. You know, there's, there's a metronome mark, but one's a live performance, the first one, and the second one's re CD recording, which is obviously much more um, considered. It's not the same level of adrenaline. Um, the notation, of course, invites that, that degree of variation. Um, there are a lot of complex playing techniques. Uh, arguably, it never will sound the same. The score is very, very precisely notated um, rhythmically in terms of playing techniques, pitch, everything. Um, but curiously, it, it doesn't always sound the same. There, there's quite a variation in the way it can possibly sound in, in, in when it's realised in performance. And how much of that is what I heard when I wrote it? We have two performances which are potentially quite different. 
we get this with any kind of music, of course. Um, but it's interesting to consider, I said at the beginning, do I hear what I hear when a piece is realised? Um, I don't know how many of you are composers in the room, but there's that interesting thing. Does anybody ever play a piece of yours the way you imagined it would be? Um, does that piece that existed in your head ever exist anywhere? Um, once you put it down in notation, it goes out into the world, and as we hear, all sorts of different things can happen with it. To me, it sounds the same. I recognise it. It is the same piece, but obviously there's quite a, a degree of, of latitude in, in what could be done. I haven't got time to go into compositional techniques. I just quickly want to show you some uh, sketches of uh, the kind of processes I go through. So this is from a piece called Black Icons, which is for solo cello and an ensemble. These are what I call timelines. You can see this is part, an early part of the compositional process where there are layers of rhythmic information. Um, I mentioned in the talk earlier um, what I call um, auditive scanning. It's a term I would like to introduce, in, 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 along with all the ones that uh, Adrian Gordon um, mentions. The, the, the idea that um, you can, I can look at this, for example, and start to hear a piece. There's nothing there yet. It's just rhythms, it's time signatures. They're all part of the, the latent musical structure that's there when I compose. But I already knew what the piece was going to sound like at this stage. Um, a further development of this is rhythmic information, which is then developed onto these timeline cycles, which looks like this. These layers here are options. The top, top line here is actual rhythmic information, uh, uh, time, as a timeline, I'm sorry. This is rhythmic information, which is being taken from another part of the piece. This is a further option of, of an embellishment. To me, this already sounds like something. When I look at this, um, I do the auditive scanning process, and I start to think what the piece might sound like. From this kind of information, um, I can start to hear the piece in my head. This is how the final page of the score ended up looking. There are lots of glissandi in it, which is what I was hearing. I heard this dense web-like texture um, in, in the strings here, and that was already there in the, in the sketches in information that I had previously. Um, now, we're getting very short of time if we're going to have questions, so I'm just going to go on to a, a piece of mine which works with um, improvised elements as well. So this is a, it's got the rather clunky title of a concerto for improvising soloists in two ensembles. The two ensembles, um, one is nota using notated material and the other is a group of improvisers who have no nota notated material at all. Now, there's a lot of auditive um, activity that goes on in a piece like this. On the one hand, there's the music I've written, um, there was what I was expecting to hear from the piece, even in passages where the material isn't notated. Um, I had an expectation of what the piece would sound like. Um, there are musicians reading information, so they're going through the auditive process of responding to notation. And then there are musicians who are improvising but are being told in what way to improvise. So they're being told to listen to what's going on, so they're auditively responding to something that's notated, possibly. They don't always know. Um, they're told to, re to listen to something that's going on in the ensemble and improvise with it. They don't know whether that person is improvising themselves or whether they're playing notated material, which is the area I was interested in exploring. So there's lots of pages of information like this. I'll, I'll go over them for time reasons. This is the score for the improvisers. You notice there are interjections which are improvisations, so the piece, in a sense, comes in and out of focus. Um, there are areas where there's very specific kinds of notational activity going on, which seamlessly blends into improvised material. Nobody knows where or when. Um, the piece is directed, and, and the person directing it, in this case it was me, then the, in the elements you're going to hear, um, I can choose what happens when. So I tell the musicians when to play, what to play. I can choose the order of the piece, like, like a mobile form uh, structure, for example. But then the musicians sometimes have a choice of what material they can play within what I've asked them to do, so that they don't necessarily have to play exactly what I tell them to do. They sometimes have a reservoir of information. So just to give you an idea of what the materials look like, this is some of the notated material. This is the bass clarinet part. In fact, I'll, I'm going to play you, it starts with improvisation, but I'm going to play you the part of the piece where the ensemble come in. Again, I'll play you two 
different versions. There are turntables in this room. same passage, if it is the same passage. This is another structure in the piece, which looks very abstract, but for me, in terms of how it was going to sound, it was a very specific image. I knew what I was going to get from a page like this. Um, it looks like a block of chords, but you can see there are instructions about what the players do with these chords. They have pitches um, that they can interpret in a particular kind of way. So they decide in performance, on cues from the conductor, um, how they interpret the, the blocks of material. Again, I'll play you two different versions of this. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because it relates to what I had in my head when I was composing the piece, so what I was hearing. Um, it sounds different every time it's played, but it uh, always sounds like I expected it to, even though it doesn't sound the same. The oboe is the soloist in this one. a different version of the same passage. It's actually quite different, but still sounds the same, if you understand what I mean. It's completely different, but gesturally it has the same kind of contour and shape to it. The, the piece explores lots of different combinations of the players. Sometimes they play like this, where they're playing together. This is the violin and cello. And sometimes there are passages like this, which have no notated material as such, except the players are being asked, where it says D here, for example, they're at, players are being asked to draw on material from section D in the piece and then to respond and work with it in different ways. Um, I'll play this passage for you as well. You can follow the score. <laughs> <laughs> 
same passage. This is just another example of musicians who are being asked to work with particular kinds of notated material. It's time for me to stop if we're going to have questions, so thank you very much. And if you have any questions. Well, thank you, Roger. And uh, any questions, comments? You're welcome. Um, I'm fascinated by your music, and the first time I heard it last year, it captivated me. Thank you. I thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, I'd like if you could talk about the space between improvisation and composition. Um, in particular, the imagery. Said in this last piece, things come in and out of focus. What are you seeing? <laughs> and you're an improviser. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm also an improviser. And on Thursday, I improvise on a piece, on Thursday, I'm, I'm playing a piece of John Cage on the Carillon, where I'm asked to interpret the grain of wood on Friday. And that piece is very different every time I play it. When you are improvising something, and I would call that improvisation, or following a score that's as precise as some of your scores are, what's in and out of focus for you? And what are you seeing? In and out of focus is how it relates to the, the musical image that I have in my head. Uh, I deliberately explore what I would call being out of focus. The, the piano piece, for example, is a piece which isn't very focused. The cello piece is a piece which is very focused. And pieces that have improvisation come in and out of focus because they have materials which are very precisely notated and will always sound like that. And there are other materials which, like the box um, notation we saw here, it always sounds how I expected it to, but it always sounds completely different because the musicians make the decision in the performance what they're going to do. Is out of focus for you the unknown? I don't think it's... No, it's not unknown. Um, it, it's, it's to do with the image. It, it's like... Uh, this is why I was relating it to painting, for example, that you can have a, a photograph, which is... You know, arguably a precise representation of what we see. It depends how it's taken. You know, that's obviously a big statement. But um, then you can have a, pa a painter who tries to reproduce that, uh, as, for example, figurative painters in, in the past did when we didn't have photography. Or you get painters like Cezanne um, or Francis Bacon um, who try to distort the way we see the image. It's still figurative. Um, it's still very much the person, but it's not figurative in the sense that photography is. And for me, m musical notation has a similar kind of relationship. So if I w was to put up here um, the, the music to Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, you would all hear it in your heads immediately. You're all musicians. I assume you can all sight sing and sight read. So you would all hear it in your heads immediately and, and know how it goes. When we look at the Fernie Hill score, that's much harder to do. If we sit and study it, we can start to, to work it out. But from an, an immediate initial look at it, you can't tell how it would sound. And it's, it's that kind of blurring of the, the musical image which interests me, from something where we look at it and think, that goes like this, to something where we think, I'm not sure what that goes like, to something where there is no notation. I, I actually question whether a piece like The Cage is improvised, where we, you're being asked to improvise. Cage might use the word, I, I know Christian Wolf L. Brown did, did use the word improvisation, but it, it's at a, a different time in musical history. Um, I, I personally don't think so because there's a score involved and I think it's a very different dynamic. Um, what interests me about, for example, the very complex notation is that I'm asking, uh, for example, the cellist in this piece to do the kind of things an improviser might do but it's psychologically a very different situation to look at it and work through the process of learning the piece and then perform it than 
suddenly doing it because it occurs to you in a performance as an improviser. It's all very, very different. Um, the painter you saw, for example, I, I work with quite a lot, and we've sometimes used his paintings as scores. And for me, as I said, like with, with Cardew's treatise, it has a lot of notational information. I don't think I'm improvising when I'm looking at a piece like that. I'm reading the potential of the score, as opposed to just having the instrument. No, I didn't. I didn't think he would. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same with Stockhausen. You know, the Ausdens even Targen text, which Stockhausen called intuitive music, and they weren't improvised pieces for him. It's a different psychological space. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi. Hi. I, I don't think there's conduction involved in, in this as such. Um, conduction is a process where the, the conductor tells who to play and they can decide what to play. And um, This is more, more like a mobile form piece, but it has different kinds of notation. So it has very precise notation, it has notation like this, um, and it has no notation. Um, Everything is prescribed in the score according to events. So it's not conduction in the sense that I'm controlling. I would say you're now going to play section E and you're going to play and you're going to play, but they might have precisely notated material. So it's somewhere between conduction and it's, it's not quite as free as, as conduction, though. Interesting area. Though. Sorry? Interesting area. Yeah, it's, I find it fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to know, we, we, we can't even begin to have the discussion, but. What, whether you think what you're listening to is being improvised or whether it's, be, it's notated when we listen to the piece. Yeah. Well, there are about <clears throat> a dozen questions that um, I'm thinking about asking now. I don't know where to start. No, I'm, I'm going to ask it later. But um, uh, one comment um, on uh, how the um, perhaps uh, we somehow clarify this is uh, instead of the word image which even if blurred even if vague um, suggests um, <coughs> somehow something more definitive something more uh, something that supplies more detail uh, perhaps I think it's about uh, mental schema that would be the term for <coughs> some more sketchier mental structures, which can then be productive for many other areas, uh, which can um, then easily translate into different media. So uh, having this rough mental schema allows you to hear uh, many different renditions of the same piece uh, as really conforming to this mental schema. So uh, that's one psychological perspective on all of that. There is another perspective, I mean, uh, actually saying something that I would like to hear your comments on. Um, the other is thinking about, you know, um, whether this is the same piece or, or, or two different pieces. For you it's the same, for the listener, I think that our reaction was more uh, in line with different pieces. But then um, I'm going to anticipate something that I'm going to say in my presentation. We might take a different psychological tack and think about different levels. Probably unconsciously, our unconscious mind is capable of tolerating uh, huge distortions of, of the original image and still preserve the identity, which the conscious part, the rational part, is not ready for. Just to make you hear your comments. I, I, is, I'm not sure there's a question, is there? What? 
Well, it's more like uh, an invitation to you to come. Well, you, you, you covered several areas there. The idea of, of an image. I, I agree. It's, I, I don't know what other word to use. Um, what, what did you describe it as? A, 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 as a mental scenery. That's, yeah. um, that, that sounds too precise in a way. Um, uh, but it's precise in a way, uh, but it's also defined as something very sketchy and which allows uh, many particular and different lines mapping onto huge number of different... It, it, it depends on, on the point in, in, in the process of composition, I would say, because when, when a piece s starts to be written and it starts to unfold, then you get to the stage of what I would call a, a mental s schema like that. But you know what the form of the piece is. You might know what the form of the piece When I said to you, if we're all going to write a string quartet, where do we start? It, it usually is something... In, in, in your head. Even, I mean, I'm a very structural composer in the sense that I, I, I work out lots of structures in advance that I use as compositional grids to react to. Um, but when I actually think, no, I'm going to write the music, there's something here. And as I was trying to illustrate, like, for example, with the piano piece, it's, it's not necessarily pitches or even a, a very specific gesture which I'm going to transcribe. I couldn't even begin to transcribe a piece like that. Um, and it's it's more it's closer to an image, I would say, of, of what the not even what the score looks like, but the potentiality of the notation. It's very hard to to actually describe the relationship there. And whether pieces sound the same, I mean, well, it depends, of course, a lot on the the, the degree of latitude in the in the material itself. So in a, in a piece like this one, it, it, it's actually in, intended to sound different, um, as you heard. There are aspects that I deliberately play, played contrasting sections because there are aspects that sound the same, um, structures which can be immediately assimilated, but the stuff inside those structures is completely different every time. But there's something about it which makes it identify, identify as being the same. With the cello piece, I said, does it sound the same? And some of you shook your heads which is a bit shocking, <laughs> um, because to me it does sound the same. It sounds like the same piece. The, the, the notation itself in, invites... Um, again, that, uh, this coming in and out of focus, it, 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 it invites that, that there's a certain degree of la lack of focus in the material, but it's still always the same to me. So it, it depends. That, that's, that's what fascinates me, actually, um, as a composer. That that I, I, I quoted Edwin Gordon about does it, it, identifying whether, whether something is the same or not the same, and I said something which is potentially not the same is more interesting than something that is the same. So it's not a transcriptive process, it's a find, finding a way through notation to represent something in whatever form it ends up being. Well, thank you. Uh, well, the, the last question, yes? I'm, gl I'm glad you asked that question because gesture is a key word, isn't it? Um, for me, gesture is, is like the equivalent of, of a figure. If we think about painting, there's, a, there's the figure. And, and in music, it's a gesture, uh, the, the, the gesture of, of, of the material itself. Um, and that's part of the image, in a sense. And the lack of money, I mean, it's an interesting case. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure he... Um, what was the expression I used? Um, auditive scanning. He obviously worked with an instrument to develop those sounds and had that as a reservoir of material in his head and then started to make gestures out of it. It is a very gestural piece, actually, but it's notated in a way because you, you couldn't notate it in any other way. But so it's notated in a way where the gestures are sort of not there on the page, but they're there in the music. Yeah. So we're quick, 
Well, I, I'm always interested, as I think I was, I was trying, I don't know if it came across, but I was trying to say that I'm always interested in, in moving away from that, that historical inherited aspect of notation. We can either go completely over the other side and use uh, notation like Lachenmann, or we use the, the notational system we have, but we have to reinvent it in some way to, to move away from what we would call a cliche. I, I use the word cliche, you know, there's, there's that inherited aspect of the notation that inevitably restricts what we can do and it's finding ways of opening it out um, to find new ways of, of notating and accessing material that's, that's beyond what the notation seems to do but gesture is a very important word yeah yes thank you once again and we have to continue with the second paper